Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring sysadmin expert, Don Pizzette. Security specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. Hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and I'm joined, as always, by Don Pizzette. Don, I've got a question for you, not just how you doing, because we know you're fine. Uh, it's Olympic season. Favorite summer Olympic sport? Favorite? Oh, I'm I'm more of a winter Olympics person, so uh, summer would be tough. Um, man, that that's a hard one. You've got I don't like know. running. Uh, there's jumping. Pole, <laughs> pole vault. Maybe? Pole vault. That is exciting. That's an interesting one. Interesting. That's an exciting one. And you hear that uh, that beautiful voice of Daniel oh. Lowry back here. I, Wes was was. You're lucky he's on vacation because he would have fought you for that spot. <laughs> it seemed like. How you doing? Welcome to welcome back. Well, it's good to be back, everybody. Thanks for having me back in. Uh, I was a little sick under the weather. But I'm back in the game, ready to go for it. And favorite favorite Olympic sport? Favorite? Oh, I guess if we're talking summer Olympics, maybe shooting or taekwondo or something. Oh, yeah, they do like the air rifle stuff. Yeah. I, I like the shooting with the skiing though. I'm with Don. No, uh, I'm, just, I'm definitely a winter Olympics you, you person. You always want to pair the the shooting with something that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I want to see I'm, rhythmic I'm gonna, gymnastics yeah. and shooting. I was gonna say, I want to build bird cages and. <laughs> And well, not a not a technado topic for us, but the biathlon is based on World War One when people would actually have to ski to engage right. in battle. So that's why yeah. they ski and shoot. So a little history. That's right. Good right. stuff. Fair enough. Well, I think that could relate to gymnastics too. Yeah. <laughs> and we are jo- miles with a rifle. <laughs> yeah, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> uh, we are joined uh, as well by Linda Palanza, who is the CEO of One View Commerce. Linda, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And can't let you off the hook. Same question, uh, Olympics. Olympic you, sport. you know, you really got me there. I was a little struggling, and then I said, uh, "How could I forget horseback riding? All anything to do with horseback riding? I did it all my life." Sure. What do they call it? It's uh, it's got a different name, doesn't it? Or you have dressage, dressage, and the show jumping, hmm. the eventing. That's right. Because I remember, I think it was Mitt Romney had the the horse that was in That's the Olympics. Right. And that was the dressage horse. The dressage. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go with the. The trampoline one. It's a it's a lesser oh, yeah. popular I one, but I mean that's just that's just a lot cooler. You know, more flips per Eurythmics. Flip. Yeah. The Eurythmics. <laughs> yeah, not not the rhythmic. You know, honestly, success. I feel like we've learned a lot today, and I think we've met our intellectual component for this podcast, so yeah. now we can just, just goof off the rest yeah, of the time. We, Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we covered more than we normally do. I'm gonna eat these already. crayons real quick and we'll get to this. Well, Linda, <laughs> we want to find out more about One View Commerce and, and what you guys are doing there and some exciting stuff about the industry. So let's go ahead and jump into our first segment, which is rapid fire questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, in this segment, what we're going to do is rapidly fire questions at you. Uh, We'll rotate through each of us. As we ask questions, you'll have approximately one minute to answer each question. If you take too long, you'll get buzzed like this. And we'll move on to the next question. Uh, You should be able to see the timer off on the side of your screen, and we will get started with Peter. All right, so uh, Linda, can you tell us just a little bit of an overview uh, of One View Commerce and, and specifically how you guys came up with that name. Sure. Okay. So One View Commerce is a software technology company that really is about um, modernizing the store. Um, so we all know those old cash registers that sit in the store um, and how they were really there to take cash and to ring up a sale and print a receipt. Um, in 2010, um, the industry was changing because the iPhones came out and suddenly we could um, see the website that the customer, the retailer had while we were in the store. And all of a sudden we saw those weren't the same, but we could buy online. And then when we went to return to the store, um, um, you know, they, they'd say, well, you can't return that you bought online and you look over and it's the exact same sweater sitting there. So we couldn't understand that. So we really saw this as an opportunity to really modernize tech and bring a new tech stock stack to market. And our real focus, which is our name, was to deliver that no matter where the customer shopped, the technology had to be able to deliver one view of a customer, one view of inventory and one view of orders. All right. Now, I'm curious. You are CEO and founder of the company. So you've been there since day one. And I know it's really difficult to create a startup and get a company off the ground. But for you, it was even harder because you're dealing in the world of uh, commerce, right? And so there's a lot of risk involved with those technology solutions. So what, what was it like starting a company like that? How did you overcome the risks? What was your experience like? So I, I think probably the first thing I should say is I, I was an entrepreneur before and I probably, you know, in my first two software companies, um, I, I started off as a programmer, um, but the first two um, CEOs told me that I was going to be an entrepreneur someday. So there's probably a bit of confidence in that. Um, I had done a small startup before, so I, I understood that. But really what I, I think that 
um, the real path was to really understand that what is it you really wanted to deliver. And, and we started off, our chairman came up with that we wanted to be a great company. And it's really quite an easy pattern because a great company means you have to have great people and um, you have to have a great product and you have to have great customers. And you're not going to have great customers unless you have a great product and, or great people. So if you put, put all of those together, you realize that in order to really um, create a software company, you really have to have um, those three main tenants um, and, and really, really great products. So, you know, coming from that computer science background, I was a little bit geeky. Um, I came from the 70s and 80s where it was really all about hardware and operating systems. So I was trained um, on how to build an um, assembly language and things like that. But I really did think and believe right from that time that um, I, I believed that we could make businesses better through technology. So if you really look at that as the foundation, um, we really built this company around understanding what we wanted to do, understanding that we wanted customers to like us, which meant we had to have great people and we had to build great great products. So really one of the main tenets that I always tell all of the engineers and really everybody in the company, our product owners, anybody on the scrum teams, that it's important to fail forward. So I let them make decisions and I let them make sometimes decisions that end up we have to go rework. But I believe that as a result, they work um, smarter and they, they learn because um, software companies have gotten away from the fact that we are creators of new technology and we want to bring those to market. So really focus on our team and our people and let them learn from both their mistakes and their successes. And, you know, that's really what I feel is my job as CEO to bring to the table. I really like your philosophy, Linda. I think it's uh, going to go a long way and uh, more people should uh, adopt that. Now, let's talk a little bit about growing companies. And really, honestly, a lot of times it's that first big customer that really helps a growing co uh, company. And you guys landed Kroger as your first big customer. Tell me a little bit about that. How did that work out? Um, well, you know, it, it is, it's sometimes you do have to pinch yourself, but I think that um, probably key to note is that we had already um, turned heads globally by winning Australia Post, and Australia Post is exactly that, they're the post office for all of Australia, but they're also the largest and most trusted retailer um, within Australia, and here they were, and they have one shareholder, it's the government of Australia, so you can imagine the, the risk adversity that's there, and they picked us, this young company out of Boston, so you know, we had already had some proof points here, but what you see is that pattern is that they're not even close to the size of Kroger. But um, when we got Kroger, their vision and our solution were aligned. And probably I should say our, our architecture and our vision as well. Um, big companies often really do look to these smaller tech companies um, to move their own agendas um, fat, uh, up ahead faster, I probably should say, or forward faster. You know, they, they like the agile, they like the new technology stacks. And so they, they, they saw all of this and said that they wanted to, but most importantly, they did not see a transaction engine that could power a store or power delivery or power omni-channel as their secret sauce. They really saw their experience, their, the experiences they wanted to drive to their customers as their secret sauce, their ability to do digital couponing and, and loyalty and, and, and really um, better supply chain. So they didn't want to focus on the transaction engine because they felt that that is a commodity. So they, they really saw us as delivering on that commodity so they could deliver on the experience. And that really goes back to giving um, retailers control. And when they have control of the experience, uh, we see great things coming to market. So, Linda, you mentioned something a, a couple of times there, and I want to I want to move forward to to our next segment because it kind of segues really well there. Um, in this segment, we wanted to look at an article which is from McKinsey.com. Uh, it is Omnichannel, the path to value. So uh, you, you've you know mentioned that term a couple of times. For people that aren't familiar with that, can I tell us what Omnichannel is and 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 why that is important in this industry? Yeah, so I, I think you'll probably hear multiple people say it multiple ways, but I think the most important thing is just to say that through the evolution of retail, we've created um, up to, let's say, three channels or more. So the first channel is we went and shopped in the store. 
And then the second channel was that we started to um, order from catalogs, those paper catalogs that used to show up in the mail. And then our last channel, of course, is, um, is online. And so each of these came at different points in, in technology evolution. And so they all have different tech stacks. They all address different problems. The pause in store, its primary, primary goal was to really keep that cash safe and account for that cash that was going in the drawers um, because there was a, a lot of it. And then when we started to use catalogs, it was much more about you know marketing and ease and delivering to our door. And then we all know what online does. But with each of these different tech stacks, what we created was technology silos. So Omnichannel is really looking at how you um, reduce those silos to give you what I said, which is that one view and um, to be able to have a seamless experience so that we feel that no matter where we shop, um, we are dealing with that brand in the same way. And I think that's really it. Now, where, you, where these things go amiss is how do you solve that problem? We believe in solving that problem through one tech stack that can manage all of the channels. Others, older companies um, that we'll always compete with will sometimes band-aid and bubble gum things together to give the same solution. But in the long run, asking about Kroger, that's not how you can have um, unbelievable growth um, in development markets. Well, you, you mentioned you know the the internet is kind of that that last of the channels, and that's something we didn't really see. I feel like to in grocery stores and pl places like that it, until pretty recently. There were there were the Instacarts and things, but there were a lot of early adopters on that. But COVID has kind of changed the game here, and yeah. uh, you know we what we saw eighteen months ago is very different than what we see that experience like today uh, in shopping. So, what do you see as the the big things that are are going to to stick around from that and and the the trends that are going to continue uh, as we as we move past COVID? You know, I, I, it's really interesting because um, when we when COVID started, we had just done our first delivery with Kroger in terms of um, buy online, pick up at a Walgreens store. And people are like, Walgreens store? Why would Kroger have you pick up at a Walgreens store? Well, Walgreens is 10,000 stores um, within five miles of almost the entire U.S. population. So um, so that was that was one direction that they were going. But in terms of COVID, suddenly they, they um, needed to really refocus the direction they were already looking at something very interesting which is these new um, robotic distribution centers um, that are able to pick these goods um, automatically at a fraction of the cost and um, very, very quickly. And so they kind of really fast paced getting those, those distribution centers into the market faster, while at the same time, very um, working to um, optimize the picking capability so that we didn't have to go in the store, right? And so using our tech, they really, um, they really focused on being able to um, optimize that whole process of, um, let's call it touchless, frictionless, um, interaction with the brand, right? And so we see that all the way through retail. Many, many different retailers are, are looking at that. What, what I see is a lot of that's not going away. So going back to that Kroger example, um, you know, they've now built these distribution warehouses and they're putting them in areas that they don't have stores, okay? And so suddenly now you're looking at the ability to order your groceries online and have them delivered to your door. But somebody like Kroger, it doesn't have to put 50, where, um, I'm sorry, stores in that, in that um, in that area to be able to service that customer. So we've really started to say, you know what, we didn't think we really wanted you to deliver our ice cream to our door, but COVID caused us to, to fundamentally shift. Asia and Europe have had the delivery forever and it's been very successful, but we weren't embracing it. But suddenly um, what we see here to stay is the new ways that we want to shop that we found actually give us more time to be able to do other things. Who wants to sit in a grocery store or any other store for great deals of time? If the experience is as positive online, then we will continue to use that. And that's what we're really seeing is the trends, is the, the real COVID trends are picking up at the curb or picking up um, or deliver to your curb, but also making sure that's done in such a way that it's a positive experience. As I said, if it's being done by a gig worker and your ice cream comes in its soup, you're probably not going to do it again. But if it comes and it's just coming out of a frozen truck, then that's a very positive experience. And you like it because it's giving you a lot of time. If it comes from a robot. Yeah. yeah, it's funny you mention all this because like b before the show, we were talking about Kroger and I, I had shopped at a Kroger before, but I didn't think there were any in Florida. And so I started Googling and I saw that there was a distribution facility down outside of Orlando. And I thought, 
Why is there a distribution facility if there's no stores? And I, I didn't realize that they had started doing uh, robotic picking and shipping and delivery like that. Uh, it, we're, I think we're far enough outside of Orlando they wouldn't deliver yeah. to here. But if you lived in the area, it, it's a great way for them to cover a huge territory. And, and talk about an adapting technology. So for a company to, to be able to adopt that and move forward, you, you mentioned catalogs. And catalogs, for me, have always been a great example of how quickly an industry can change. You know, for mm-hmm. almost... Almost a hundred years, people shopped from the Sears catalog. And Don's then, got a whole stack of Fingerhut catalogs. <laughs> that went away, and it wasn't long after no. the Sears went away, That's right? True. So yeah. you, you, you can buy a house from the Sears catalog <laughs> yeah. back in the day, literally. Yeah, yeah. 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 literally could. So very, very cool stuff. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see those uh, those price savings maybe trickle down to us, the customer. I mean, <laughs> that's how it works. Because yeah. rent for those uh, <laughs> you know those, those stores has to be you know one of their their large ex- expenses. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And um, just just uh, for Kroger, it's 90 miles within uh, a warehouse that circumference that they can deliver to. So it's quite wide. I, know, I need cool. to think about that when I move. How, yeah. where, where exactly <laughs> that, that is in Orlando? If I, yeah. I'm at 89. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, ice cream might be Pain a little, well, city. <laughs> refrigerated trucks, I'm yeah. sure. So yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, Linda, so what are what are some of the things coming up for uh, One View Commerce? You know, obviously we've talked about the change in the industry. So are you guys, I'm sure, are evolving with it and have some some new things coming out. Yeah, I, I think that you know, as a result of the success that we've had in, in during during COVID with with the customers, um, you know, our platform is now matured, and what we're seeing is we're seeing a real push now to people starting to say we need to modernize our tech stacks too. We need to go this direction. I mean, you know, to to once again talk about Kroger from COVID until today, they have actually output over six separate initiatives. Um, on, um, on our solution in that short amount of time. Everything from, you know, as I said, pick up a curb and delivery to also the ability to take payment at curb and to be able to take um, EBT and SNAP, which is for the less fortunate, their ability to buy the groceries in the same way everybody else might be enjoying online. So being able to deliver, that's unheard of for a company that large to be able to deliver that much tech in that much time. And so what we've really done is the, per, the platform has been very proven and and the results are now public because these are public companies. So we're really now um, building out our global service provider partner program so that, you know, we don't do the implementations and there's big companies, you know, the big um, SIs out there and even smaller uh, regional players who um, who can implement the solutions and, and really everybody's talking about them. In addition to that, we've launched our, our um, Microsoft partnership, which allows us to, uh, allows Microsoft to offer the um, our solution on their Azure cloud platform, which gives them a, a gives us a great global reach into the Microsoft community, and really gives retailers the ability to have another choice besides um, AWS, which is another cloud that we offer. So we're very excited about that opportunity. And really, last but not least, is is um, our SaaS offering. So what we've done is we've actually created a SaaS offering, um, and uh, Molten Brown, our co- our co- longtime customer, has just gone. Um, has just gone live with our our SaaS offering, and it's been very, very successful. And it gives mid-size and smaller retailers the same great features that the big ones like a Kroger Australia Post are enjoying um, in being able to use those, but not only that, but to be able to also um, ride on the coattails of, of these larger retailers who are kind of really creating some some new experiences out there. So a lot of very exciting things happening for us. Yeah, sounds like things are, are busy. And if you want to learn more about it, head over to oneviewcommerce.com. Uh, that's uh, one spelled out, O-N-E. Uh, viewcommerce.com and you can find all that great info uh, and learn more if you guys want to reach out so thank you uh, Linda so much for taking the time with us today it, like I said it sounds like you're extremely busy so uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day for this thank you very much I appreciate it all right everybody stay tuned we're going to take a quick break come back and talk about the tech news from this week so stick with us we'll be right back with more tech with Don Bazette this is Kevin. He's studying online for a Microsoft certification and using another online IT training service. He's also on his second pot of coffee today to stay awake. And this is Kyle. He's also studying Microsoft but using IT Pro TV. Rather than watching a boring voiceover PowerPoint, he's actually enjoying the training with two hosts in an interactive format. 
Both Kevin and Kyle have access to virtual labs and practice tests, but Kyle can also get help through a live chat with other IT Pro TV members and his instructors, as well as post to a Q&A forum. He can even search for exactly what he's looking for in the interactive video transcripts, all while paying less than Kevin. Oh, and Kyle can also watch in comfort via Roku app. Kevin and Kyle are both learning IT, but Kyle is enjoying the journey. Want to be more like Kyle? Here are the plans to start your IT Pro TV membership today. All right, welcome back to TechNado with Don Pizzette. Thank you so much to Linda for joining us. Uh, and we have a ton of news to get to, so I'll, no small talk today, guys. No. It's been a bizarre week, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, you said, like, picking these articles is a little wacky. It was so. hard. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, our first one is from Tom'sHardware.com. Dell cannot ship Alienware PCs to certain U.S. states due to power regulations. High-end PC sales excluded in certain states. So is this something that, uh, well, I guess this is this is more of a personal brand. This is not like a business brand, but, uh, I mean, this is affecting individuals that just want to get these as, as gaming devices. Yeah, well, this would apply to some graphics workstations, too, but certainly the gaming market has hit a little bit bigger. And, and this is a headline I never thought I would say, like, Certain Alienware PCs are now illegal <laughs> in the state of California. If you're caught with one, you'll be prosecuted prosecuted to the... Uh, Fullest extent of the law. There we go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they, they passed some new environmental regulations that basically said that computers need to be at least somewhat efficient. And uh, let's see, where are the numbers? Something like they can't consume more than 65 kilowatts uh, in a, you know, under normal use or 75 kilowatt hours per year. Uh, but then they put on these little add-ons where, like... If you have a high-end GPU, you're allowed to consume a little bit more power. But it's not enough to account for some of the modern graphics cards that are coming out these days, like the RTX 3080 and 3090. So there are certain configurations of Alienware computers now that if you go to Dell's website and go to buy them, they will display a warning saying they cannot be shipped to California, Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Vermont, or Washington, all of those states have environmental protections in place that make them effectively illegal. Oh, well, that's a shame. You know, the people that are looking to play the next Call of Duty game are just going to have to go to Arizona. Well, <laughs> here in Lawless, Florida, could I just get a bunch of these and then have people like remote in? Or they wouldn't get the same well, experience. It wouldn't be the same experience. Right? Well, that, that's effectively what like Steam? the um, GeForce Now services ah. and Xbox Game Pass streaming they yeah, have now yeah. where the, the games are running in a data center and you're remoting into it. Uh, now, those data centers are typically a lot more efficient. And yeah. so I think that's partly why that's allowed. And, and they're... I think we're not too far off from that future where people stop buying video games and running them locally. They do run them from the cloud. But in, in this case, yeah, it, most states don't have this stringent a law. And when, when states like California pass it, they're hoping that by requiring the manufacturers to meet these requirements in California, they'll just follow the same requirements elsewhere. And they'll, yeah, they'll just say, we'll, we'll tone it down for yeah. everybody. What I found interesting about this article was the fact that like they're, they were the only manufacturer that there was being called out about this. There are other gaming rig manufacturers that were not being called out of this, uh, or at least they weren't warning their customers, we can't ship to you. And you can also still build your own custom, right? Because technically it's not a, it's not a thing until you put it all together, right? Right. Well, this is a pretty new thing. So yeah. it, it was a stepped deployment. So the regulations came out back in January 1st, 2019. Okay. And then they moved to their more aggressive level starting July 1st, 2021, so last week. And so Alienware, or Dell, you know, was one of the first companies to modify their online shopping gotcha. cart. So they're so that's, just first to market kind of yes, thing. Yes, gotcha. right. But anybody who sells these configurations is affected the same way. And it has been getting out of hand. I, I remember having a Dell years ago that had a 400-watt power supply in it, and I upgraded to a 500-watt because I had too many hard drives, mm -hmm. and so it was bogging it down. Well, Wes had gone and built a computer with like a... Uh, a 1,000 watt or a kilowatt power supply, Ooh. and I'm like, man, you can you really suck up some power. <laughs> yeah. But if you have multiple GPUs, you need it. Yeah. All right, I've got a theory here. Uh, I'm looking at the, the specific states, and this lines up. So California, for example, has all these planes that are optimized with thermal imaging to find the <laughs> the, the pot farms. Marijuana farms, yeah. <laughs> They don't need to do that anymore. Oh, no, they got to go after gaming rigs. They're like, we got to find something to do with these planes. <laughs> Pete's signature it. says it's an alien wear boss. Yeah. We got to call in a drone yeah. strike. <laughs> that guy is gaming too hard or mining Bitcoin in that yeah. house. Little does he know he's about to be a part of that game. <laughs> well, you know, in their defense, they do have a really overstressed power grid. They do. Like, they're one of the only states. They, 
they have more money in California than any other state, but they have to do rolling brownouts yeah. and things. So they also have like a huge de- like state debt, don't they? Like in 2015, it was like 151 billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's a little. Well, they hope to make that back with the cash. fines. There from, you go. See, so it evens go. out. And then what What uh, Dell should do is conscript some people to make a game about finding people selling black market Dell Alienware in California. But then, and, like, Ender's Game, it turns out to be yeah, real. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, that, there's that spot in... Um, uh, it's Reno where you can just walk across, uh, oh, you know, right. California because the, yeah. the, the, the the casinos, the road the casinos on, like have a fence at the end, mm-hmm. and you have to like walk around it because they can't even have a road that goes to to that. But there's going to just be computers lined yeah. up now yes. on that Nevada side. That's actually our next article: is a uh, new Alienware store geez. is opened up <laughs> right there. Oh, and it's powered by coal. <laughs> oh, it's clean coal. Right. Clean coal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Our next article is actually from bleepingcomputer.com, and it is new Windows 10 vulnerability allows anyone to get admin privileges and uh that's what you want to hear yeah that's not great is it, now i know we we talk about sometimes these headlines are sensationalized is this that case here or i mean can no, anybody just do that this one's real and uh <laughs> and, cool. and uh, my laptop actually the laptop i'm on right now i did double check just before the show i'm fully updated and it is still affected. So uh, what happened was at, at some point in 2018, Microsoft pushed some new permissions. And your registry in Windows and your, your SAM database where all your secu- security credentials are stored is normally placed in a directory that people don't have access to. You have to be an administrator to access it. The operating system is allowed to read it, but regular users can't. Well, in 2018, they changed the permissions and made it where... Anybody can read those databases. Anybody what who, could go wrong, it, <laughs> If you have any user account, including a guest user account on the system, you would be able to read that, uh, that, that file. And since you can read the file, you can look into the SAM database and find the tokens that authenticate an admin, and now you're an admin, and off you go. So you do have to have physical access to the machine. You do have to have a login, although any login will do. So the real risk for this would be like if you go to a university lab, where they allow students to use the machine, any student could become an admin if they wanted. So that's the problem. Uh, in clean installs of Windows, this does not happen. The permissions are set right. But for people like myself, where I've upgraded this machine, I'm running the latest 21H2. Uh, because I've upgraded, it's retained those wrong permissions. And so Microsoft is trying to figure out how to fix that, like what what it was that led to this being set wrong, how to correct it. And as of the taping of this episode, they have not fixed it. Could this be a ploy to get people to be really excited about Windows 11? <laughs> Maybe. Does it, does it affect Windows 11 as well? Does I don't know. I, I didn't test it. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, you, you know, it's funny. I was, uh, you know, I was teaching CEH today, and we were talking about privilege escalation, and you know, we talk about why does this happen? What what are things that we can do to help mitigate that? And one of the problems is permissions, right? One of the biggest issues is usually that somebody just jacked up the permissions the way yep. that allowed someone to be able to reach in and touch something that they shouldn't be able to do, either through over, oversight or just hurried, whatever the case is, this is the kind of thing that happens. And it seems really simple, right? Oh, go in and change the permission, and then it won't be a problem anymore, which is it seems like a, a viable solution, at least short term. Uh, keep it from inheriting permissions from above, and you should be all right with that. But the fact is, somebody at Microsoft accidentally or on purpose, for whatever reason, said, "Hey, I'm just going to set the permissions for everybody to be able to read a very sensitive file." Yep, and and you mentioned inheritance. So uh, I said that Microsoft has not patched this yet, which mm-hmm. is is true. They have not. Uh, however, they have released a workaround. And one of the workarounds is to re-enable inheritance on that folder because the permissions are right on the folder, just wrong just on, on the files. Fi- I got you. But these are well-documented files, yeah. and so people know they exist. They always have the same name, and so they can be predicted. So this is a, this is a bad one. Uh, also worth mentioning is that even after you correct the permissions, you're still at risk because of the volume shadow copies. Microsoft Windows makes volume shadow copies. These are, are kind of like backups of any changed file, and somebody could still access those, which also have the wrong permissions. So you not only have to re-enable inheritance, but you also have to erase your volume shadow copies. So, and what's interesting is volume shadow copy is there to help us, right? Mm-hmm. It's there to protect us. Oh no, I accidentally deleted something. Don't worry, I've got volume shadow copy turned on. Let me just go grab the copy. And it just goes to show you, this is why, I was talking with somebody, this is why security is so hard. We're doing things to try to protect ourselves, but at the end of the day, at some point in time, it could be the linchpin that actually undoes us. So it's it's a very difficult thing to, uh, in 
make something secure, especially something as complex as a computer system, let alone a network of systems. So yeah. you start to see the, the, the problem there. All right, you heard it here first. Uh, go ahead and delete those backups. <laughs> this message was brought to you by malware uh, creators. Yes. <laughs> We're waiting Are for you Are you looking to do that. for quality malware? Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they do actually have the commands where you can delete just the backups of those files, yeah, oh, nice. not your whole backup. Okay. But uh, but the joke's still good. Yeah, yeah. do that. It still you works. Get, you get credit on that one. Yeah. All right. We'll allow it. <laughs> well, our next article is kind of similar in terms of stupidity and uh <laughs> this is part of our dough segment all right this one is from arstechnica.com google pushed a one character typo to production bricking chrome os devices oops yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I, one character i mean what I was trying to think of uh, like a funny single character. I only I could come up with F U, but that's two characters. What? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to get. What did just they? Possibly... It would have to be R for resume, I imagine. So should I go home and like update all my Chrome books so they can send me new ones? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would assume you now owe me a device. Well, so here's here's the deal. Here's yeah. what happened. Uh, they made an update, right? And when you get a Chromebook or a Chromebox or whatever, one of the nice things about it is it's a fully managed and maintained operating system, right? You you don't really mess around with the underlying uh, underlying OS. And when Google makes an update, they just push it out and you get it. It's kind of a set it and forget it type thing. Well, in this case, they made an update to some files that were involved in user authentication, specifically validating the password that you type to log in. They were off by one letter. And Oops. being off by one letter cause the passwords to never be parsed, which meant no matter what you typed in the password field, it was always wrong, <laughs> effectively bricking your device. Since it's a oh, completely cloud-supported device, you, know, you, you just couldn't log in at all, and you were locked out. Uh, you had really two options, which was one, to wait for Google to fix it, which they have now fixed it, or two, to do a power wash. Power wash mm. is where you factory reset the device and, and lose all your data. Now, on a Chromebook, that's not so bad, right, right. Daniel? Yeah. I've got a couple of Chromebooks. My wife uses one, and my kids use them. And from time to time, that is a great feature. Everything's in the cloud, right? It's all about Google, right? The cloud services that Google provides, the docs, the email, the drive, the this and that and the other. And you're just basically getting a piece of hardware with a mouse, keyboard, and a screen so that you can interface with the web browser and access all the information. So, yeah, it's not a big deal to power wash these things. I've done it a bunch of times just because, you know, things go a little hinky from time to time. In yeah. the operating system, power wash puts it back at factory, and it just seems like a new machine at that point. But it does kind of reaffirm a, I don't want to call it a conspiracy, but, you know, mm -hmm. a theory that people talk about, about how, like, I, I don't want to use a Chrombook because it, what if Google goes out of business tomorrow? Because that's happening. Also, well, yeah, not yeah. in our lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, you are dependent on those companies to keep the devices up and running. Sure. And at any point, they can decide. You know what? We don't support that device anymore, and, and yeah. that's the end of it, right? And you're just out of luck. Now you got a worthless computer. So this is an example of that kind of thing happening. Uh, if you had your own standalone OS, maybe this wouldn't have happened. But you likely would have had all sorts of other things because you got to maintain security. And then it's up to you to like make sure all that stuff continues to work. And if anything breaks. Guess who's the uh, the resident tech for that? Yeah. Google? No. Oh. <laughs> Me? Yeah, I mean, you can call Google, and they'll probably have a pretty good chuckle at your I think expense. you can call Google. <laughs> yeah. Good well, luck you with that. Call. You oh, can yeah. call. Yeah. I call them all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> Every day of the week. <laughs> all right. Well, that, uh, that's Which very smart. Also does take more than one letter. <laughs> <laughs> our, uh, our next article is, is also dope. Well, let's go ahead and play that intro again. And also from Ars Technica, uh, VPN servers seized by Ukrainian authorities weren't encrypted. <laughs> uh, just going back first, wh why were these servers being seized by the Ukrainian authorities? Well, uh, this might be shocking to you guys, but uh, many VPN services are used for illicit and illegal what? activities. No way. I know. Why would you even do that? And and these things range from horrible crimes like uh, uh, pedophilia. You Child know, pornography. Exchange, yeah. Right. Uh, to Say more what? acceptable crimes like uh, bypassing Netflix's regional yeah. uh, It's locks. victimless. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, still illegal, right? Yes. Uh, and so yeah. the various VPN providers that are out there, 
they almost all make the claim like we don't log any activity and yeah. our servers are encrypted and your data is safe. No one will be able to know what you did while you're connected to this VPN total protection. But we've talked about it here on the podcast in the past. There's a total amount of trust. We're trusting when they say, oh, we don't maintain logs. How do you know that? You don't. It's not like you can go we and audit pinky these swear. people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We pinky swear. It's not even a pinky square because you can't, yeah. can't, yeah, can't yeah. touch their pinky. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, anyhow, there's a lot of trust. So in this case, Winscribe was actually clearing their logs. So there's that. They, they weren't maintaining those. However, their servers were not encrypted. And so what happened was the uh, Ukrainian authorities were able to seize these servers and not shut them down but begin to operate them, to turn on the logs, <laughs> to be able to monitor all the traffic that was going through for a period of time. And now they have that information to be able to use to prosecute or for whatever it is that they want to do. So, um, you know, I, I guess it goes... They're worth, wa watching worth, Netflix. It, <laughs> it's worth reminding people that Ukraine is our NATO ally, but, yeah. you know, there's a lot of shady things that happen over there. So not, not a good scenario. All not around. every country's perfect, huh? <laughs> is this a, a laziness thing uh, that, that this uh, company probably did this? Because because it seems like, you know, if, the, if they're, they know they're serving shady people, potentially, they would want to encrypt that stuff to not get in trouble with these shady people. They would want to, but... I don't I don't know that it's laziness as much as just they you know these are not the high end security professionals that are standing up VPN services because high end security professionals know that this is used for illegal stuff yeah right and they don't want to go to court for it I did read in here somewhere that they were talking about how they were trying to increase the um, bandwidth I guess you know the the ability to use it in a production uh, efficiency of the system by not encrypting things. Uh, so that kind of didn't work out for him so well. Yeah. yeah. If, if I'm the Ukrainian authorities here, I, I'm not seizing them. I'm just taking them over. Because <laughs> couldn't you then just, you've got, hey, you're, you're in my VPN. I can see what you're doing, right? Yeah. Well, you know, we could improve the efficiency of the roads by taking out all the stop signs and stoplights. Oh, man, they'll move. You'll be able to go a lot faster. That's right. Uh, they will move <laughs> very <laughs> for a very brief time yeah. until... The fire. <laughs> the giant I ball of doom. I can't see that. Yeah. All right. So our, our moral of the day, though, is that if you're using a VPN service, you cannot rely on them to provide security because you have no visibility into it. Even if there's like contracts and stuff, like would you be, would there be any <laughs> recourse? It's a contract, like, right? It's a it's a formal yeah, pinky I mean, swear. Maybe not in the Ukraine, but maybe if the company is located here. That's why America, I only use Pornhub be... VPN. <laughs> I, you know, if there's one lesson I've learned. It's that a contract is a contract is a contract, but only with a Ferengi. Oh, that's true. That's I, true. I don't remember the rule of acquisition number, but it oh, is. Oh man, I'll one have of to them. look that up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's move along to our next article, which this week we're going to see who got pwned. Looks like you're about to get pwned. Fatality. Yeah! All right, this one is from theregister.com. Hole blasted in gun trader. UK firearm sales website CRM database uh, breached. 111,000 users' info spilled online. One of the worst things that could happen to a privacy-focused community. Now, in, in terms of breaches, this one doesn't go down as like the world's no. biggest breach. 111,000, right? Versus, ex uh, not Experian, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, Equifax. Equifax yeah. with, with their, you know, hundreds of millions what was or it, 150 million people or whatever. Facebook, it was? Yeah. where it was yeah. like all over the people. A billion. Yeah. All the people. <laughs> so anybody with a, like a social security yeah. number and has grown. <laughs> However, in this case, it was a firearm sales database, right? Hmm. So all 111,000 of these people are firearms owners. Now, if you're not familiar with the UK's laws, it is illegal for a citizen of the UK to own a firearm unless they are licensed and registered with the government to possess it. So that means there's documentation that shows, in theory, every right. firearm owned by a law-abiding citizen in the UK, right? So the criminals tend not to register. So isn't this all basically public record then? <laughs> well, so no, normally it's protected information, right? Oh, okay. So yeah, you can't get at it, right? But here, this database was breached, and so now this is in the wild. And if you are, let, let's say, we'll go worst case scenario, right? Let's let's uh, uh, blow this up, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you're a criminal in the UK 
and you want access to a firearm, they're kind of hard to find because huh. not everybody has them like here in the U.S. So, so you could take this database where it has these people's mailing address and in some cases exactly what firearm it is they have. You could shop. Yeah. <laughs> Does it say what room in the house they yeah. leave it? It doesn't have no. that, oddly enough, but you would certainly know where to target. So this is, while not one of the biggest breaches by any means, it's likely one of the most dangerous because hmm. it involves firearms in a country that, that doesn't have as many firearms as, as several others. Uh, you know, here in the U.S., if you break into a home, I, I don't have the statistics, but there's a pretty good chance there's going to be a firearm yeah, in like home. Yeah, like normally trip over, you. Yeah, I, yeah. I tripped over a gun just coming in the window. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, especially, I mean, you just go to Texas. Sir, right? this is dangerous. <laughs> yeah. uh, or maybe Minnesota or uh, somewhere. Here I am just trying to pill for your pockets and then walk off with your goods, and I I'm almost uh, <laughs> knocking my brains out. <laughs> I'm tripping over this AR-15, whatnot. <laughs> well, with this with this uh, breach, you could also find out what gun safe they bought, if they have a lock, you know. So you could you could come prepared with the right pick and everything. You could watch yeah. the right lock picking lawyer video yeah, before yeah, exactly. you go over there. <laughs> and that's all I have for you, sir. Today. Do you have anything to declare? Nothing I'd want to tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, do we know how this this breach happened? Uh, through the normal means, uh, basically there was a uh, unpatched security hole that the attackers were able to use to get oh, into their know. database. Actually, I think it started with a SQL injection, didn't it? Uh, let me pull uh, it was that. six oh, zero days. It was bigger uh, than Stuxnet. <laughs> <because that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> Once they got in, they were able to lift the entire SQL database. Yeah. So you know it, it could have been either way. But once the, you find one of them SQL injections, it's pretty trivial to basically dump that database yeah. afterwards. But the significant thing here, though, is the the mailing addresses yeah. and and the, the the type of data, right? So this is something we see in IT security is that you've got to you got to classify your data based on its. Uh, Impact, right? Yeah. I, I'm using the wrong word for that, Daniel. What is that? Like severity? Yeah. So um, I mean, uh, impact seems fine because right. because you're talking about whether or not this is going to be low, medium, high impact or critical. So yep. you start thinking of those rag charts and stuff of severity severity versus probability. So in, in this scenario, it's a small breach, 111,000 people, but really, really impactful data. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Uh, that they had to, you had to send in a, uh, a notification every time your gun was sold, obviously, uh, dropped off for repair, gifted, mm -hmm. loaned. Hey, loaned Daniel yeah. the gun for the weekend. Uh, I got to find Hey, can I borrow that gun? Uh, well, if you fill out the appropriate <laughs> not, paperwork, not, Daniel. Not a big deal, you know. Yeah. Just, I, uh, I only need four bullets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. Well, uh, I'm sorry to all the. Uh, our UK gun owners out there um, listening, send in, uh, you know, let us know in the viewer mail if just, that affected you. Just don't <laughs> trust the internet, right? Yeah. Don't put your stuff out there. But there's going to be a lot of people reporting, like, oh, yeah. fake, you know, stolen weapons now, <laughs> I think. All right, our last one here. Is this the last one? Yeah, it is. Is actually something that we have uh, talked about before, so this is going to be Deja News. Deja News. All right, this one comes from the record.media, and this is a, an article or a story that we knew we would be coming back to at some point very soon. Kaseya obtains our evil decryptor, starts customer data recovery operations. And we, when we say obtains, we mean paid ransom for, because... Well, so Other, the, otherwise you're restoring from backups, right? There is a lot unsaid here, so uh, <laughs> so let's let's unpack this a little bit, right? Uh, you guys all all may remember that the uh, Kaseya, which is a product of Connectwise, the Kaseya VSA servers were compromised by Revil or R Evil or however you want to say well, that. I, I went with, with R Evil because we looked we looked up something that said R Evil. Yeah, and it was well, completely wrong. Yeah. So. Oh. The point was, you said it, was it so me. we can't go with yeah. that. So, no, yeah, so real. no credibility uh, there. That's true. People might be using things I yeah. say as like, see, this is how you say it. Yeah. No, it's not. And once they compromised the Kaseya servers, they were able to push out the ransomware to all of these clients of managed service providers. And so they were able to uh, encrypt thousands of machines affecting hundreds of clients. It was a really big deal. Well, it's been a couple of weeks now. And in that time people kind of had a choice. So choice number one was restore from backup, right? Which is a, an arduous process. You've got to restore all your machines and you have to make sure you've patched whatever exploit it was that was used to compromise the network. So it's, it's a lot of work. 
or you sit around and wait and hope somebody gets a decryptor. Well, I normally tell people you're a fool if you sit around and wait because usually the decryptors come out a year, two years later, so you can't sit around that long. What are you saying that there's like one uh, decryption code for any specific yep. kind of malware? There's not. Well, what just, I just depends. If I infect you, I, I give you this code. If I infect you, I give you a different code. Oh yeah, yeah. So it, when it might be one Trojan or, or ransomware worm or whatever that infects machines, but on every machine, it uses the machine's ID to generate a different key for it. I see. So it's not one key that decrypts everything. Yeah. And so when you pay the ransom, they're running a program on their end, in, in, if they even respond. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they then send you the key just for your computer. Okay. And when schools get hit and hospitals get hit, if they have a thousand computers, that's a thousand keys, and that's why their ransom is so much higher. They'll charge them, well, and because yeah. they have the money, yeah. <laughs> uh, but they'll they'll charge them a million dollars or whatever. Well, in this case, after only a few weeks, right? So uh, the the compromise happened on July second, and they announced this. When did they announce this? Um, oh shoot, July twenty second, twenty twenty one. No, that it, no, they just announced it the other day. So it, it's been about sixteen days, I think, since they announced yeah. this, or since. The initial compromise happened. So in a period of roughly two weeks, they've secured not just one key, but a decryptor. So it's something that will generate the key for any machine that has been encrypted I by see. this ransomware, which is really impressive. And it begs the question of where did they get it? Because right? you're saying that the, the the malware person wouldn't give you that. They would give you your key, not, usually, not the no. decryption. Yeah. I mean, if you pay them a butt ton of sure. money. But yeah. they, we're talking about this company, these, this organization that is encrypting machines all around the globe and not getting punished at all. So they're not just going to give it away. But the, uh, the Kaseya spokesperson merely said that it came from a, and I quote, trusted third party, mm. end quote. And well, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm sold. <laughs> Which means we trust our insurance agent who paid the ransom for us. <laughs> so you can trust anybody, right? Yeah. So let's speculate. You right? trust me, don't you? Daniel, <laughs> who do you think the trusted third party is here? Uh, probably the ransomware designer, the people that made this stuff. You so, trust they're trusted? What would what would be their motivation to turn that over? Uh, money. So do you think they got Maybe paid? Maybe they got paid. I have no idea where they would have got this from. You know, unless some really smart people were able to somehow reverse engineer the encryption. That's my guess. The trusted third party is the NSA. So those are kind of the two theories yeah, right there. Yeah. So on, on Daniel's, I'll defend yours for a moment. Uh, if you think about it, Kaseya really screwed over their customers. Yeah. So who who's going to trust a, a company that, that's done that, right? And not, they did it intentionally. Yeah, and, and they were doing a lot of really good security practices, but they were doing some bad things too. So I could see them going to the ransomware group and saying, look, Y'all about to get paid. Yeah, you told us it's a million dollars for this. How much for the yeah. for the whole? For the we whole. want to take Can't care of our customers, and then yeah. they can always generate a different private key on oh, their yeah. next ransomware, and off they go. So, very very possible that's what happened. They yeah. just paid, right? Uh, in in that case, they wouldn't want to disclose it, and they're as trusted as they can get if they're the people who wrote yeah, the ransomware. That's true. Yeah. We because it works. That's why we trust it. But <laughs> Peter also mentioned the NSA, right? So the NSA is working on a lot of this stuff, and potentially they could have created a decryptor somehow, which would indicate either one that the Revil group has been compromised, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's almost impossible to guess these private keys. Right? I heard they use Ukrainian VPNs. <laughs> well, they, they could. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah. very yeah. efficient. I hear they're the yeah. fastest. Yeah. <laughs> Super <laughs> quick. So, Or they have found some way to possibly brute force these private keys, which would require an immense amount of computing power and the NSA has invested in quantum technologies and things, so it's true. potentially we are there. We don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe even Kaseya doesn't know. Maybe a guy in a trench coat knocked yeah. on their back door one day and sold it to them, and uh, they don't know who it was. But we'll, we'll probably never find out. So there's a, a tweet embedded in here um, from MSASoft CTO Fabian Walser, who says, Some researchers are, researchers are propagating that since a large number of victims hit during the Revol Kaseya attack were hit with the same public key, only one victim paying the ransom will be enough to decrypt all victims, potentially. Well, that would be an unusually amateur mistake of yep. Revol as it a be. group. They they typically use a separate key for every single machine. Well, I, I hope we find out more about this and do another Deja News soon yeah. because it, yeah. this is an interesting. I mean, this this is a plot for a movie we're talking about <laughs> with people in trench coats coming to the back door or you know negotiating with the. Have we had a good ransomware time, movie? I was about to say, when's the last time we had a really good computer security? That's not just total movie. BS. Yeah. yeah, I don't I mean, know. That I, we can't, have. I can't think of one. I can't like, think of yeah. anything that's had like ransomware. Antitrust or... was pretty good, but that was in the yeah, late nineties or something. Yeah, social. 
Was it that? Oh, yeah, Ant- oh Antitrust. I was saying Social yeah. Network. Yeah, Antitrust was... That was a decent movie. Ryan Felipe. Really. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. Well, anyhow, I, I'm we'll going to <laughs> I'm gonna double down yeah. on my advice, though, that it's not wise to wait for a decryptor unless mm. your backups are shot. You're like, if you have no other choice, you can wait. But it is certainly an outlier to get a decryptor this fast. That is not a normal thing. Yeah. Well, good for Kaseya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either way. Well, good for their customers. Whoever Whoever still bad for Kaseya. Up, right, yeah. yeah. You don't want to be in the news about Good this job time. squaring it away. All right. Hey, we want to let you know uh, tomorrow... We're playing CompTIA Jeopardy, so that is uh, Friday, July 30th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, right here on the IT Pro TV on air page. So just sign up for a free membership. Uh, you can watch as, as Don hosts. And what do we have? Uh, we're going to have Ronnie, Wes, and Adam. and Adam as our contestants, all people who have uh, taught CompTIA courses. So should be probably our most competitive uh, mm. Jeopardy game yet. So uh, make sure to sign up for that. And, and don't worry if you missed that uh, or if you're watching the podcast later than, than that came out, we will definitely put that on YouTube because it is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, also got some webinars coming up. Uh, let's see. The next one is How Apprenticeships Help Employees and Employers. Come to you. Apprenticeships are powering and diversifying the IT workforce. That is Thursday, August 5th, uh, so next week. And that's Amy Cardell uh, is going to be the host of that one. So head over to itpro.tv slash webinars, and you can register for that one and see all the past webinars as well. And finally, head over to technado.com. Uh, you can send us a note to let us know your feedback on what we've talked about today. You can listen to the latest episodes. You can also hit the big orange button in the corner, sponsored by IT Pro TV, and get a 30% off coupon code for the lifetime of your personal membership and find out about the options available to teams from IT Pro TV. All right, guys, this is a good one today. We learned about uh, Omnichannel. Omni yeah. I learned that Kroger is in Florida. And their robots are. Yeah, yeah. Kroger's robots are in Florida. Now, when they pick your prescription medication out, do they just keep that? They just, yeah, because it's straight to the source. That's their food. (laughs) That's their food. Do you think that they can have the Kroger robots in California, or is that too much energy consumption? Oh, yeah, it might be an energy consumption. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. They're not run off Alienware (laughs) computers. All right, well, thanks, everybody, for joining us, and thanks, you guys. Good to have you back, Daniel. Thank you, sir. And, uh, yeah, good to have the old team back together. And we'll see you next week right here on Technator with Don Bazette.